Now, it's time for Made in the Northwest. We're here in Portland, Oregon at the legendary Leatherman. Ben, thanks for having us down, man. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for coming out to see us. This is going to be so exciting today. I'm super stoked. Let's talk about the history of Leatherman a little bit. All right. I'd love to do that with you and show you how we turn coils of steel into Leatherman tools. Oh, this is going to be great. So where did you guys get started? So Leatherman started, the story behind the, the Leatherman product is that Tim Leatherman was on a budget trip through Europe back in the 70s. And in 1975, on a piece of paper, he wrote uh, out a pair of pliers to a knife, a Swiss Army knife or a, mm -hmm. a scout knife that he was using at the time. And uh, when he came home from the trip, he went to work trying to figure out how to put pliers in that scout knife. And after just seven short years, he had finally succeeded <laughs> in getting a uh, pair of pliers into a scout knife and then uh, he spent a number of years trying to get it into the marketplace. Got his very first order in 1983, mm -hmm. which is 40 years ago, why we're selling, celebrating our anniversary this year. And uh, the rest is history, I guess, so to speak. That's great. Well, I'm excited to go see how these things get built. Should we head out that way? That'd be great. Let's I'd do it. I'd love to show you. All right, what do we got here? Yeah, so uh, we, not only do we make all the Leatherman tools here in Portland, Oregon, but we also design them. So in our corporate headquarters here, we have our human resource department, we have a finance, we have all the sales, marketing, but most, more interestingly, we have our product development team. So we do all the product research, the engineering, the design, the, and the manufacturing of our tooling as well. So right here, we design our tooling. And in this area, we actually build the prototypes for our products and as well as all of the tooling to manufacture a Leatherman tool. Wow, these dies are pretty complex. Oh, they're very complicated. Uh, so what we're, what we're looking at here actually is one of the dies that's in for maintenance right now. And these very large die sets, we run, they run in a 300 ton press, has about an eight foot long bed. And what you're looking at is one enormous die set which has one, two, three, four. This particular one has basically five stamping dies in one die set. And so the coil of steel, the steel is gonna start in one end of the die and be fed through. And with each cycle of the press, it's punching out a little bit more metal, shaping it a little more until a finished handle or frame comes out the other end. Wow. These dies are in for maintenance. So like I said, about every 50,000 cycles of the press, we have to take the whole thing apart resharpen it, retune it, put it back together so we can run the next 50,000 parts. Wow, there's a lot of work on that, you can just tell. Yeah. Each one of these dies, we spent, I mean, it'll take us six months to build a die like this. Yeah. So, with the one, a little die, one of the smaller dies that makes a small part for us, you know, it's a it's a several months project, it probably costs us ten or $20,000 to make one of those. Yeah. A great big die like some of these might cost us upwards of $200,000 to build. Wow. And it, we have, it takes about 175 stamping dies in our library to produce all the different Leatherman tools. So we kind of like to compare that to a garage. Like you could have a garage full of you know, Priuses all the way up to Porsches. Nice. All right, I love the stamping machine. It's super cool. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. This happens to be one of my very favorite machines as well because I can hear this sound all over the building. And every two strokes of that press is pretty much indicative of a Leatherman tool having been born. Nice. <laughs> and so the way that it works is the steel, it comes in a coil. Yep. We buy our steel from a mill in Ohio. It comes in a coil, it goes through, from a reel through a straightening machine. Mm -hmm. This is a little sonar that measures how much steel is being fed to the press. Uh, right here, uh, just beyond this control panel is an indexing unit that feeds the steel in. And then once the steel gets into the die, each cycle of the press indexes that steel forward by about the length of a, the handle of a Leatherman tool. Nice. So after about 16 cycles, a finished Leatherman frame, in this case, is going to come out. Uh, the part that I'm holding in my hand actually is the frame for uh, the Leatherman charge. But the process would be similar whether it was a Leatherman, whether it was a super tool or a wave or what have you. That's impressive. All right, so what is this machine doing today? All right. So these are basically really fancy rock tumblers. The part goes in here for eight hours for deburring, like a vibratory rock tumbler, and then it'll go in here about eight hours for polishing. Okay. People often ask me, how do you get the parts out of there, Ben? And we use a mag there's a really strong magnet down here, which sucks the parts out onto the conveyor so that we get the parts separated from the polishing media. That's cool. Man, you got a lot going on over here. Yeah. Well, so we just saw how we stamp the parts out of the coils of steel. And before they go to heat treating, mm -hmm. most, many, if not all of our parts go through some kind of a machining operation to have 
either high precision or three-dimensional features added to them that we couldn't put into the stamping process. Okay. So this is one of our, our cells for uh, CNC machining. Each one of these is a four-axis uh, vertical machining center uh, fed by uh, flexible automation. So we put the parts in a hopper. It goes in front of a camera where the part gets uh, the shaker table, presents the parts. There's a camera in there that looks at the part picks the part out, and then the, can the robot arm then will load one of two machining centers that it's, that it's connected to. Wow. Uh, each one, each, uh, the, the basic formula we have here is we have one, auto, one robot to two milling machines, and then one uh, operator to four robots. There we go. Man, you got a lot of parts flying through here. Yeah, and each one of these machines makes everything. They make Phillips screwdrivers, they make uh, Raptor finger loops, Raptor cutting blades, they make uh, knife blades out of premium knife blade materials. They make tread, knife handles. Okay. Everything, everything that's got machining in it goes through machines like these. All right. Well, All looks right. like we're putting some stuff together. All right. Well, now it's starting to look like a Leatherman tool. Yeah. So the two jaw halves that we just saw being uh, in the raw condition, they're now come back from heat treating, mm -hmm. and she's going to assemble two jaw halves that have now been machined and uh, bead blasted and heat treated. She's going to assemble them with some grease and a rivet, and, and then the rivet will be formed. After the rivet's formed, we have to check each and every one to make sure that there's a proper amount of friction in the joint. We want enough in there that the wire cutters have close proximity to each other so that they can cut through cop photocopy of paper or business cards or yep. super fine electrical wire, but not so much friction that the, that the tool won't function smoothly. All right, next step. Next step. All right, so we've seen how the jaw was made. Now we're gonna get to see a little a handle get polished and assembled. So in this area, each of the operators has a robot to assist them in polishing a handle. They'll uh, keep the robot fed with parts, and while the robot's doing the polishing, uh, the operator will be building a sub-assembly, like in this one we're doing the wave. All right, what do we have here? All right, well, many of Leatherman tools have a saw blade or a file in them. Uh, we manufacture our own saws and files in this area. Oh wow! So this machine is a feeder mechanism, which is loading, which is presenting a part to a robot. The robot's going to pick up the saw blank, which I'm holding, and the robot's going to load first a machine that grinds the teeth into the saw blade, mm -hmm. and then a machine that grinds the bevel, and then it's going to deburr the saw blade and put it in a magazine over there so it can be used to go to assembly next. All right, looks like we're nearing final assembly. Yeah, we're getting close to the end. So every Leatherman tool is built by hand. So we built all the components, and you saw a lot of automation. You saw robots throughout the factory. But, but in the end, we have to build them by hand. And the design of the product is such that it's not very conducive to automation. Yeah. And we're not willing to compromise on the performance of the product or the design of the product or the fit and finish of the product, so we build them all by hand. Nice. All right, so we're standing in the warranty department. This is where people like me that break things send things in, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so every Leatherman tool that's ever made had a, came with a 25-year guarantee against defects in materials and workmanship. Now, okay. even though we've been in business 40 years, we're still repairing every single tool that is sent to us, no matter whether it was made 40 years ago or 25 years ago or two years ago. Nice. I can also tell you that the vast majority of the tools that come through this warranty department aren't defects in materials and workmanship. <laughs> There, I got it. Oh, I shot it with a gun. I my <laughs> ostrich ate it. It went through my. I ran it over the rototiller. It went in the wood chipper. You name it, we've seen it. Wow. And those 40 years of experience in our warranty department are really what has helped inform the product development and the evolution of our products. Our specifications aren't born out of of, of, of looking at a table in a in a government standard. They're born out of 40 years of people telling us how they ruin their Leatherman tool and us trying to improve the product so that we can withstand those tests. Yeah, those tests of time. Yeah. And sometimes there's nothing that's going to withstand that <laughs> test. That's right. But I'm also super proud of the fact that we fix every, we fix the See, tools. See, that's a huge deal. So it's not just that they come in and we give you a new one. It'll go here. It'll be checked in. They'll determine whether it can be fixed or not. And back here, you can see these people are actually repairing your tool. And if you want the same tool back, you can have it back for sure. If you don't specify, we're going to do our best to repair it and return it to you. Some of them, the ones that are burned up in car crashes or shot mm -hmm. with guns, can't necessarily be repaired. Yep. You might get a different one back.
All right, Ben, we got the finished products here. Thanks for having us out. Oh, thank you so much for making time to come out and see how we convert coils of steel into leather and tools right here in Portland, oh, Oregon. This is great. We got finished products. What are we looking at, man? All right, well, this is a, a little sampling of things that we make here. We've got the Leatherman Micra over there. Here we've got the Leatherman Free Series. And then here we got the Leatherman Surge. This is our Raptor, which you know a lot of people don't know us for as well, but it's all about uh, extracting a person from their clothing or their vehicle in a medical emergency. The Free Series uh, Pliers tool, and this is our Signal, which is really all about camping and starting fires. And well, and right in front, I gotta point out, this is our Wave Tool, best-selling Leatherman of all time. Oh, that is great, man. So how do people find these if they want to pick one up? Yeah, if you're interested in learning more about Leatherman or buying a Leatherman, just go to Leatherman.com. There we go. Leatherman tools made right here in Portland, right in the Northwest. That's Mr. Crunch. <laughs>